In 1945, we thought, oh, at last, peace and prosperity, and everybody was working, and things were going up, and all of a sudden we started choking on what we were doing. Noble have I created thee, why dost thou abase thyself? Our destiny is noble indeed. Many people say if it could only be as it was when we were children, when things were simple, why can't it be as it was? And I was thinking, it can't be because all the people living in those old houses have changed. Maybe the houses haven't changed, but the people have changed. And the times have changed. And there is no going back anymore. of this conversation is to talk about the progress that we've seen in the 25 years in the advancement of women and gender equality. At a time when we are commemorating the 25th anniversary of the Beijing Conference in 1995. The UN has done what it does best, which is to help surface and raise the visibility of this issue, but it hasn't been able to do what governments and the culture has to do. Mm -hmm. I think what we are learning within Baha'i communities is that we have to be investing in building strong, resilient communities at the local level because that is where the lasting change, the sustained change is going to happen. We have a goal on gender equality, the Sustainable Development Goals, that also accepts and says very clearly that even though it's a standalone goal, it cross cuts with every single other goal. And we shouldn't take it for granted or assume that this was kind of natural. It took tremendous effort. An open letter to the women of the world from the women delegates and advisors at the first assembly of the United Nations. We call on the governments of the world to encourage women everywhere to take a more active part in national and international affairs. This Universal Declaration of Human Rights may well become the international Magna Carta of all men everywhere. We have learned valuable lessons in the past five years. The attitudinal prejudices which stand in the way of women's advancement are held by women as well as by men. Time is short for us to rectify the present unsustainable patterns. We must achieve greater equality. We have proposed an equal rights amendment. Those delegations who are in favor of draft resolution one entitled the role of women in the preparation of societies for life and peace, raise their hands, please. The women's movement is about changes in a society, about changes that are global. We want this to be remembered as a conference of women, by women, and for women. I declare open the 41st session of the Commission on the Status of Women. We have to give real meaning to the ideals of women's equality. This has been a century of women's emancipation. Aging was something we all share. Today, we all own the great responsibility of implementing the platform for action. The first 63 years have been momentous. Today, let us be clear about what needs to change. So the World Conference on Women in Beijing 
1995 was like a springboard for many women and many organizations that were working on women's rights to help us see that uh, women's rights and women's advancement is not a Western feminist idea, but it is very much in their culture. I was born in Malaysia. My father came from China as a school teacher. My mother was a local born, a Peranakan as they call it. And like many women of that time, my grandmother had bound feet. Hers was about six inches. Now, the mother had bound her feet when she was an infant. And um, the beauty was described as a, a woman with a three inch feet walking and swaying like a weeping willow. So she suffered a lot from the binding of her feet that deformed her feet. To walk is really very painful. It took a lot of courage of my grandmother not to bind the feet of my mother. And because of that, it liberated me from this tradition of bound feet. This yeah. is Beijing. Oh, it's Beijing. That's, that's Beijing. That's Ros Harris. Yeah. And Virginia. Wow. Oh. Which one's you, Mary? I'm not seeing you. Here, yeah, you won't believe it, but that. Oh, that's yeah. you. That's right. I remember yeah. your suit. Yeah. Yeah, that's Mary. Yeah. That's right. Oh my gosh. Uh, there's a long history of the bi-international community with the United Nations and uh, for a long time it was one person who carried the burden or however you want to look at it and that was Mildred Matajeta and she certainly was a mentor out there for all of us to, mm -hmm. on the international level. That period of time uh, was ending uh, just as I came in, really. So Mary will remember that when I came to the UN and she was the representative, we used to have many different agencies at the UN that were responsible for gender equality. It was all over the place and there was no unity. When uh, the Commission on the Status of Women was meeting, it so happened that I was the chair of the NGO Committee on the mm. Status of Women. Mm -hmm. Uh, just like Mary had been <laughs> 10 years mm -hmm. before that. And so we decided to send a letter to the Secretary General Kofi Annan. And finally, in 2010, a resolution was passed that created UN Women. That's so nice, because also 25 years after, yeah. after Beijing, um, now at the United Nations, they're thinking about all of the different ways of advancing this. So they're working at the grassroots level, they're also working at the national level with their governments, they're here at the international level. And we see that gender equality today is very much at the forefront of the public mind. And what's really nice is that young people are thinking about all of the different ways of advancing this. And we're seeing that happen around the world, which is really exciting. मेरे फादर तो वो वो भी वही चाहते थे कि मेरे घर की भी बेटी बाहर ना निकले लोग उसको देखे ना 
और अदर कास्ट मतलब जो कास्ट था कि जो ऊंची जात और छोटी जात का बहुत डिफरेंस था तो मैं मेरा परिवार हाई कास्ट में आता था और जब जिस लड़के को मैं पसंद करती थी वो गांव में रहते थे और उनका जो बैकग्राउंड था उनका रहने का तरीका था वो सब चेंज था तो बस मेरा ये कि उद्देश्य था कि मैं वहाँ पे जाऊँगी लेकिन मैं समाज की सेवा कर सकती हूँ जहाँ पे मेरे पति मुझे बराबर का अधिकार देंगे और मैं उनके साथ कदम से कदम मिला के चल लूँगी लेकिन जगह जगह पे लोग मजाक उड़ाते थे जैसे हम लोग देर में आते थे तो साथ में मेरे हस्बैंड मेरे साथ कपड़े धुलवा ले या झाड़ू लगवा ले तो लोग गांव के लोग हंसते थे हम लोगों को देख के पीठ पीछे बुराई करते थे फिर वो देखते देखते मैंने इतने सालों में देखा कि एक दिन मैं ऐसे खड़ी थी तो बगल के पड़ोसी के मे के एक नेबर्स जो थे वो उठ के झाड़ू लगा रहे थे तो मैं हंसने लगी तो उन्होंने कहा क्यों हंस रहे हैं आप क्या आप बिजनेस तो झाड़ू लगाते हैं ना तो मैंने कहा इसलिए नहीं मैंने कहा कि मुझे लगा कि शायद परिवर्तन हो रहा और ये मुझे देख के खुशी है कि आपने भी इस कार्य को किया We could see now for parents, they really believe that in terms of, for example, preparing food, they really believe that it is the women who can only do that. If they are going together in the field, they, the husband will only carry an axe around. But to find that the woman is carrying half buckets on her head with cassava, including vegetables, the husband will not help. You cannot come near to a, a woman who is preparing food. It was not allowed at first. So even these boys and girls who have been grown, they could see that difference. The husband would just come and shout at the woman to say, why are you not cleaning the house? Why are you not preparing food at this time? But him is just sitting like this, waiting for a woman. A woman who come from very far from the farm, she's very tired, she puts there and then start touch other things, she does this and this, and then she gives first food to the men. Her, she will eat at last. But now men, they have come to see that this barrier that we created to see that this is for women, this is for men, it is really pulling us down. We cannot grow. We recently became parents. Our daughter is almost a year and a half. So that really brought in a whole new element of what housework looks like if you're striving for gender equality, what income looks like if you're striving for gender equality, what childcare looks like. For us, gender equality doesn't mean sameness. So it doesn't mean that like we necessarily do the same tasks the same amount, but somewhere in there, there's a balance. I think the biggest barrier remains to be expectation of what is equality mean and how do we as a couple and how do we as a family really address that expectation and and when it's correct, apply it correctly, and when it leaves much to be desired, how can we alter that in how we live our lives? But I think it's one of the things we've discussed a lot where Kimmy is very driven in her career, and as am I. So we say, well, how can we um, both succeed out there in the world as well as at home with equal voices in our marriage? Our daughter has so much joy, like I think even more than the average baby, maybe I'm biased, <laughs> but she just like screams with delight all of the time. And you see how women in this world are, are barraged with so many things and so many challenges. And so I know these challenges will come her way. For her to keep that bit of joy for herself is gonna, going to require, I think, resilience to all these challenges that come and just you know having the tools to to take the world for what it is and, and make it a better place, but retain that part of herself that, that is so valuable to me and so valuable to, to many others, I think. One of the things that I think we both think about a lot in raising Rumi, our son, is cultivating his gentleness and giving him the space to be who he is. He it has this boldness and he has this courage and he has this energy. 
Um, and he has all these things that I know people are going to like love and encourage about him because he's a boy, but he's also, he's full of gentleness and thoughtfulness and compassion. He's so observant. He sits in silence beautifully. He is like creative and collaborative. He loves beautiful things. And those are like these attributes that are just as beautiful about him. And I don't want any one thing to mean that he can't be the other thing. As a Baha'i, understanding the, the unity of the world uh, is, is something that, that we really hold dear. And raising Rumi is one of the things that I think I do as a member of the human race. Starting a family really feels like we're beginning to participate in a, in a dialogue that, that exists across the entire world. It's not something that exists in America or something that exists in Asia. It's something that we all do together. Nosotros como, como familia siempre hacemos la consulta, uh -huh. siempre hacemos consulta. Entonces, eh, a pesar que son muy chicos, hay temas que consultamos juntos, que están a, a en su nivel de entendimiento. Una cita que me inspira y que amo es la que dice que, cuan, que las dos alas de un pájaro son como el hombre y la mujer. Y cuando las dos se juntan, el pájaro puede volar fuerte. Y un ejemplo que doy es el de mi hermano, que cuando yo hago oficio, él me ayuda y así podemos progresar juntos. Este es importante porque este, si yo dejo a mi hermana que haga todo el oficio solo, va a terminar, pero ella tiene que hacer otras cosas, no todo el tiempo puede estar haciendo el oficio como si fuera la, la, la que trabaja acá. जब मेरी शादी हुई 2008 में तो पहले गांव में लोग जो नई बहू आती थी तो उसको बाहर निकालने नहीं दिया जाता था तो मैं एक विद्यालय चलाता था तो मैंने अपनी पत्नी से कहा कि तुम दूसरे तीसरे दिन से ही जैसे आई वैसे ही मैं अपनी पत्नी को बाहर लेके आया और विद्यालय में पढ़ाने के लिए बोला लेकिन उसके अगेंस्ट फिर गांव वाले लोग काफी विरोध किए कि अभी नई बहू है और तुम बाहर कैसे ले जा सकते हो ये है वो दुनिया भर की बातें लोगों ने बताई लेकिन हमने उनको ध्यान नहीं दिया देखिए हर माता पिता की ये ख्वाहिश होती है कि उनके बच्चे जो हैं वो सही रास्ते पे चले इसमें मेरी भी ये इच्छा है कि मेरी तीन बेटियां हैं और ये सही रास्ते पे चले और आगे बढ़ के समाज के लिए कुछ कार्य कर कार कर सके समाज में अच्छा बदलाव ला सके बस यही मेरी इच्छा है बच्चों को आ, कम उम्र से ही उनकी नैतिक शिक्षा खास तौर से और उनकी आध्यात्मिक शिक्षा पे जोर देते हैं तो बच्चे बहुत ही आ, अलग होते हैं और वो समाज में दुनिया को बदलने में अपना बेहतरीन योगदान दे पाते हैं Men have to be able to contribute, and to say that it's women's issue kind of infers that men can't contribute to their betterment. But as men are often referred to, I think they must be referred to as potential contributors. And we certainly know the problems that have been caused by patriarchy. But there are men willing and ready right now to contribute in a meaningful and appropriate way to the advancement of women. I think part of what allows toxic masculinity to flourish is it is actually the suppression of of what might be true masculinity, you know, which is not the expression we've seen, you know, we see something that's contorted. I mean cartoons, the sort of things that we expose our our youngest people to. Um, are full of even just I think visually these these certain ideals you know a, a, a man with a extreme V <laughs> broad shoulder you know he's he's good for a few things 
and a woman who's shaped like an hourglass who's also good for a few things. So we actually start force feeding our, our youngest, um, our children, our babies, like tropes more or less. And what does a spiritual perspective allow us to consider then? You know, if, 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 not that we discard the material, but we include the spiritual. So together, what kind of perspective might we have of a man, you know? Well, first, I mean, I think it's safe to say that, that we, we're, we're still exploring what healthy masculinity is. The same way that women have been oppressed, that means a co-relative suppression of what it means to be masculine. Our, our, uh, our male-dominated structures are maybe of the latter kind. They are, they are too rigid, they're calcified, they're, they're, they're hard and therefore they will break. But, but what kind of strength is it to be elastic, to bend, to be receptive? You know, this reconceptualization of, of man and woman is also the reconceptualization of society. I'm not sure exactly what principles boys need to learn at an early age to be proponents of gender equality, but I know it needs to be learned as early as possible. And the thing is, is that it can't be just one segment of their lives. You can't have their parents teaching them about gender equality and then their grandparents don't. You can't have them learning gender equality at home and then when they go to, out into community activities where gender equality is in practice. So the entire community has to contribute to that. And that means that everyone has to be on board, every single person that that child, that, that boy runs into has to enforce this ideal and that makes the change generational. Hace 25 años, más o menos la época que empecé a trabajar en la parte de educación, eh, los papás decían que estudiar no era importante. Me acuerdo una vez un señor, llegamos a la comunidad tratando de convencerlo de que dejara ir a su hija a la escuela. Y el señor decía, yo tengo animales, yo tengo terreno y, y si mi hija va a estudiar, lo que ella va a aprender es para hacer carta, a escribirle a su, a su novio, entonces no quiero. Los desafíos que hay es que la educación pueda llegar a, a todas las comunidades, pero una educación de calidad, una educación integral, que piense en la persona como un ser integral, un ser humano íntegro que está compuesta de, de tres naturalezas, la física, su cuerpo debe comer bien, alimentarse bien, vivir de manera digna, la parte intelectual, su capacidad, el ser humano tiene muchas capacidades y cómo desarrolla esas capacidades a través de la educación, pero también tiene una parte espiritual, a través de esa parte espiritual puede mostrar que es amable, es honesto, es veraz y eso es lo que nosotros necesitamos si se recibe una educación de manera, esa manera integral, podemos hacer muchas cosas, llegar a grandes cosas, porque el atraso en las comunidades, en la cultura, a veces porque la persona se capacita intelectualmente, pero no está preparado para, para tomar una buena decisión, para ser justo con lo que hace, para ser equitativo, para ser amable. Entonces es la parte que, que realmente se necesita. ये जो नैतिक कक्षा ये बच्चों के लिए बहुत ही लाभकारी साबित होती है अगर मान लीजिए अगर ये बच्चा छोटा है अगर उसको शुरुआत से ही नैतिक शिक्षा ये जो बाई चिल्ड्रेन क्लास में अगर छोटे से ही आना आने लगता है तो वो उस पेड़ की तरह होता है जब हम कोई नया पेड़ लगाते हैं तो वो धीरे धीरे जब बड़ा होकर एक विशाल पेड़ का जब वो रूप धारण करता है तब वो दूसरे को फल या फिर छाया या फिर लकड़ियाँ वो देने लगता अगर वो पेड़ छोटे से ही मान लीजिए वो उसको पानी ना दिया जाए तो ये जो नैतिक शिक्षा है ये उस छोटे पौधे की तरह है जिसको निरंतर अगर हम ये नैतिक शिक्षा से सींचते रहेंगे तो वाकई में वो आगे जाकर लाभकारी सिद्ध होगा अपने भविष्य के लिए या फिर अपने माता पिता के लिए या फिर अपने समुदाय के लिए वो एक बहुत ही अच्छे तरीके से निखर कर आएगा और अपने समुदाय को बेहतर बनाने में वो काफ़ी लाभकारी साबित होगा
I think with regard to the, the impact of the, the junior youth program on the families of the junior youth, I think one element that we've observed basically in our community is everyone is participating. I, I think to me that already is sending a signal to the family to say the same task that a boy can perform also a girl can perform. Because when you are doing the services we don't like separate this kind of work is for the girls or this kind of service is for boys but they do together. So you could find that when we are carrying out these services, it was raising some questions from the parents in the community and then trying to ask what is happening. Even the, when they, they get back to their homes, they are also taking those things which we are doing at the group level to their families. Nana Maran Pemdi di Sentai de Kurangi Ma Kurangai Pataya Kukurdo, Nea Wala, Napa Nea Wala Wale Nana Lama Skaran Yuga, Kurdo Yuga Bule, Skaran Sama Tarap Kral, Kralpun, Kapatani, Sama Kurdo Yuga, Nan Rukran. tentang peranan kerdor jadi uh, macam ji ji batin de uh, ji oh juga itu tugas uh, bukan daripada segi sekolah tali bukan daripada segi agama tali jadi ji jaga keselamatan kampung macam uh, macam anu kerdor de jikot berat juga berkenaan dengan kaum wanita de bahawa nai adalah 
satu nadut uh, situasi uh, kalau ku kampuk deh walah kerdor bermakna uh, seluruh masyarakat deh mungkin pet nature oleh kerana mong kerdor ka bermakna kira bi meningkat lek kedudukan je mai kampuk hmm. For me, I understand that the sort of context of the divine doesn't exist within this this binary of men and women, but it's something that really it's something that surpasses that. It's something that goes beyond what we can understand of this physical world. I really see my own faith as being something that helps me understand qualities of compassion and justice and equity and equality at the United Nations and and many governments um, around the world are thinking about material markers to help us identify where we've made progress and where there are gaps in, in the status of women around the world. At the same time, the proliferation of inequality, of oppression, um, of injustice in, in any way, and, and, and in this sense against women, is very obviously a spiritual problem, but it has expression in our material systems because we live in a material world. So the structures of society inevitably reflect our values, but our values are spiritual. So to only have material meters and markers is in a way to hamstring where we're able to succeed or what we're able to accomplish. When you look at the power structures of religious practices uh, over the course of, of, the, of millennia, they really have done a very good job at sidelining the voice of women and promoting the, the voice of men in those power structures. And I think that's something that we have to look at objectively and atone for because it has inhibited religion itself's ability to, to achieve what it is meant to achieve for all of humanity. But again, that's just the practice of religion. I also think that the history of religion is a history of trying to understand the world around us through a spiritual dimension. And it has always tried to confront the new challenges before humanity. And just like uh, in, in you know, decades and centuries gone by, those religious leaders who are willing to embrace it and question it and learn about it are, are going to be pointing humanity, I think, in, in a wonderful uh, direction. In many traditions and culture, as well as religion, Women do not lead press. Women are not allowed to say press at certain periods of the month. Women are not considered fit to be the one that can uh, hold the holy books or touch the holy books. Right? But the Baha'i devotional meeting changed all that. That everyone was equal, even a girl child, could say press could be the one to lead the press, could be the one to uh, have people unite together in one voice. So Baha'i devotional is a way of us seeing ourselves as um, individuals that have a spiritual side, and this spirit can be connected irrespective of what is our outer differences. लेकिन जब हम लोगों ने धीरे-धीरे प्रार्थना सभाओं को करना शुरू किया और फिर जब प्रार्थना सभाएं हुई और हम लोगों ने एक मोहल्ले से दूसरे मोहल्ले के लोगों को आमंत्रित किया और जब उसमें हम लोग चर्चा करते थे तो बहुत सारे ऐसे प्रश्न होते थे जिसमें कि क्यों ईश्वर ने हम सबको एक ही तरीके से बनाया है क्यों ईश्वर ने हम सब ईश्वर जो है वो हम सबको प्रेम करता है उसकी नजर में कोई ना ऊंचा है ना नीचा है जैसे स्वास्थ्य के ऊपर जो पत्र हैं जैसे हमारे समाज में यूनिटी के लिए जो पत्र आते हैं आपस में जैसे हम एक दूसरे से कैसे प्रेम करें और जैसे जो भी पढ़ा होता है वो उस चीज उस पत्र को पढ़ता है फिर वो अपना सुझाव व्यक्त करती हैं कि हाँ ऐसा होना चाहिए या फिर इसमें क्या परिवर्तन हो सकता है हमारे 
परिवार में क्या हो सकता है हमारे बच्चे कैसे आगे बढ़ सकते हैं उन बुरी आदतों से वो कैसे दूर रह सकते हैं जैसे कुछ महिलाएं बहुत संकोच करती हैं नहीं बोलती हैं लेकिन अब वो धीरे धीरे बोलने लगी हैं और उस चीज़ को अपने दायित्व को समझने लगी हैं कि हम किस तरह से उस कार्य को करें From what I've seen, when places try to apply these qualities of, of justice and equality, oftentimes the results fall short because what they're trying to do are create masks on material structure. But what really needs to happen is, is an entire transformation of that sort of level of the soul. So when we have this, a conviction from a spiritual place that all people are equal, all people have this inherent nobility, all people have limitless spiritual capacity, then the way that we can push forward becomes so much stronger. People who live in totally different conditions with totally different backgrounds to really come together as a collective and share how despite this variety, we still can learn from one another, we still can pick things up from one another's experiences in these really special ways. Really, it was just the beginning when I was at the UN. We made a statement on the importance of the girl child and the importance of educating the girl child to the Commission on the Status of Women in 1974. And uh, there was really not a lot of reaction to it at that time. However, when I was in Beijing for the Fourth World Conference, it became part of the program of action. That was another step forward. It was really a thrilling moment. It was, it was the influencing the process to the ultimate. And the director of the Office for the Advancement of Women at the UN came up to me and we high five. <laughs> it was really a victory. It took time. Everything takes time. It's process, process, process. Yes. But it was a wonderful moment. I've been thinking a lot about how important it is for the work that the UN does in keeping world peace. And one thing that I want to link back to what governments can do more for the education of girls is to safeguard this peace. Peace is so fragile in this day and age, and education is so dependent on peace to persist. Gender equity requires the culture of peace for us to have a sustainable future. What are the desirable and urgently needed dynamics and traits and qualities that we want to see in the world and how do they begin to play that role in a way that is both bold and humble and open and informed. So I think in education we have this rich opportunity to, to engage our imagination um, and to think very carefully about what is the world that we're building and how are we giving the tools spiritually and intellectually to our young people to come to the forefront and to play that role. So this has been really a road of 25 years. It's a learning journey for us, trying to put Baha'u'llah's teaching of equality into, into reality in all sorts of community. In this process, we hope to bring about a glimpse of a civilization that has both material and spiritual qualities. Material civilization is like a lamp. It's beautiful, it's a glass lamp, but without the light of the spirit within it, then that lamp doesn't realize its purpose. To be a civilization of the future, we need both the material and the spiritual, and both the qualities that men and women has to bring to advance this civilization. The equality of men and women is a facet of human reality, and not just a condition to be achieved for the common good. 
that which makes human beings human, their inherent dignity and nobility, is neither male nor female. The search for meaning, for purpose, for community, the capacity to love, to create, to persevere, has no gender. Such an assertion has profound implications for the organization of every aspect of human society. Since 1995, much has been learned about the enabling conditions that foster gender equality. Whatever setbacks and obstacles may appear over the next 25 years, the awakening of the majority of the peoples of the world to the truth that women and men are equal will never be lost.